All right, everybody. Welcome to the first lecture of this season's Hot Talk. We're now in our second year with a little bit of a trial run in the year before that. Um, today's Hot Talk is one that's pretty dear to my heart because it's a history Hot Talk. Uh, and it's a part of history that I don't really know a lot about, so I'm looking forward to learning about uh, things. Uh, Dr. Catherine Payne is one of our adjunct instructors here at the college. And I'm just kind of curious, Catherine, before we get going, you hold a PhD, you speak multiple languages. Can you just give us a little hint as to how your life got going and how you ended up on this path? Okay. Um, I was born in the Panhandle. I grew up on a farm outside of a town of 440 people. So I was one of those students who comes to a big town like Lincoln or Norfolk and didn't know which street light to look at across the street. <laughs> Um, but since that time, um, well, because we became, we served the Lord, we became missionaries. So I've been around the world, and that's why we speak the multiple languages. I think we're in 32 countries now. And it's been a, an incredible, amazing life, partly because I married this pig farmer from Butler County, <laughs> who has never let me get bored. So. And so with that, Give you Dr. Catherine Hayne and the Vikings on Camels. So I know you're trying to hard, have a hard time wrapping your head around putting a Viking on a camel, but to get through this, we need to dispel two stereotypes. The first one is that slave trade was only Africans, especially males, who came to the New World. The New World slavery was very peculiar because usually slavery was women and colorblind. The other one is that the Viking world was limited to the North Atlantic. And pretty much Viking studies were until they started translating ancient, not ancient, <laughs> medieval Arabic books about Arabs who had met Vikings and described them in detail. In fact, it's our only description of a, of a Viking burial, and that's we'll talk about that in our speech today. It's the only place you can get it is from the Arab sources, mainly because they, I think they were literate at this period, and most of the Europeans were not. So. This is our, our Viking world that we grew up that was in our textbooks when I was growing up, and it pretty much dominates textbooks yet today. But Vikings leaving the Scandinavia was not new. Scandinavians had been looking far out for a long, long time. So this is back in the Bronze Age. And this is a sculpture that's in the Denmark um, Museum in Copenhagen. And it's a Mycenaean um, sculpture of the horse pulling the sun god. Here's a Bronze Age Danish woman. She's 16 years old. She was wearing this miniskirt, the oak, log, coffin, dissolved all of her, her um, skin and bones, but her hair and her fingernails survived. So we know she was 16 years old. We know what she ate. We know that she traveled. She came from the Black Forest. She came up to Scandinavia, traveled someplace else, and then came back to Scandinavia from the Black Forest all before her death when she was 16 years old. But what's most interesting, look at her belt buckle. That's from the Mediterranean. The art of ancient Norway shows ships and the amber jewelry, which the Scandinavians were exporting to the Mediterranean, is all around the Mycenaean. Those were the pre-Greeks, the proto-Greeks. Um, so a thousand years before Athens and Socrates and those people you've been studying, the Danes were already sending amber to the Mediterranean. So we know that they were good sailors back a thousand years before Christ, but in the Viking era, there was new ship technology. There was a keel, which allowed for sails that they hadn't had before. To this point, they had been rowing boats every place they wanted to go. With sail power, you could go much further, much longer. And they also designed their books with a, a very shallow draft, which they could go up way, way up rivers, like up the Seine to Paris and up the Volga. But what is really critical for our story 
is that long before IKEA furniture became famous in Denmark, <laughs> they could take these boats apart with pine fittings. Now, if you notice all the art in our my thing, it still has them portaging whole ships over the mountains. Not possible. But if you could take that ship apart, you could carry it across piece by piece. Here's our ship. Look at those few men. Now, when you portage, you're going over a hill. That ship's not going over any hill with that number of people. But if you could take it apart, which they did, it makes all the rest possible. So, here's our, the Arabic text that introduced me and gave us our title. This is a description that comes from a book written in Baghdad in 849. It's written by one of the spy masters of the intelligence committee. And he wrote a book for the caliph on all the trade circuits in his kingdom. And he talked about these men who bring furs of beaver and black foxes and swords from the Sakaliba. Now, Sakaliba means Slavic lands or East Europe. Um, it was there also word for white slave. In fact, in English, our word slave comes from Slav. Both Muslims and Christians poached Slavs for their slave populations. And that's where we both get our words for slave in Slav. Um, and they bring their merchandise on camels to Baghdad. But there were already Slavic slaves there, eunuchs, who would, who would work in Baghdad and who would interpret for them so they could trade. Now, I already explained Sakaliba in Slav. Rus, which we get our word Russia from, comes from one who rose, and that we're going to meet them later. Um, and the Viking is one who embarks on a seafaring journey, and the Norse is just somebody from the north. So Viking, Norse, Scandinavian, it's all the same words, all the same people group. So for me to argue that there were Vikings on the slave route, besides my Arabic text, you would expect to find archeological evidence in Scandinavia. And so this is a ring of Allah from a grave Sweden, and if you look at it very closely, it says the God or Allah. The Islamic coins that are found in Sweden 84,000 coins. Now, this is already out of date because every year they find another hoard, and at least one's reported. They also find some that aren't reported that people just take home. But there's more Islamic coins from the Samanid dynasty in Sweden than there is in Afghanistan where these coins were made. We're going to find out why. This is a picture National Geographic painted of the trade that Ibn Cordoba describes. And it talks about how, not Ibn Cordoba, Ibn Fadlan of the trade of what they were bringing to get the silver girls. Here's another um, archaeological evidence in Sweden. This is a rune stone and it was they were erected as memorial stones. We would think of it as a stone in the cemetery. But her son, Haldadar, had traveled for gold in the east. They gave food to the eagle. They died and were eaten. And so this is evidence in Sweden of a, of a group that only one ship made it back. There's also a Buddha. This Buddha is found in a Swedish grave, but it comes from northern Pakistan, because in this period, Pakistan wasn't Muslim yet, they were still Buddhist. So 80% of the Islamic coins in Sweden, 20% come from the Baghdad, from the Abbasids, the other 80% come from the Samanid dynasty. They are in what today is Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, in Central Asia, and they're right in this critical area between the Abbasids and India and the Turkish tribes in the north. We know these as the Uyghurs, the ones that the Chinese are trying to wipe out. But these were Turkish tribes that were, um, because they lived on the steppes with horses, they were considered good warriors. So they would capture them, and girls too, and sell them as slaves. Well, slaves are such a good product they became very, very wealthy. They also, in the mountains of Afghanistan, had a silver mine. 
So they grew rich from two things, slave trade and silver. Now, what's interesting now, the Vikings had no source of silver, and they wanted silver. And so we're going to have a silver rush, just like the ones that caused the ghost towns in Colorado. Here's a description by another Arab author in his book. He says, they have a king who's called the Kalka Rus. Remember Rus, those who row? They make raids against the Slavs. They sail in ships in order to go out to them, and they take them prisoner and carry them off to Khazar and Bulgar. We know that from Bulgaria today. And they trade them there. Their only occupation is trading in furs, and in these they take, they take as a price gold and silver. So this is a description of these early, early Viking traders. But the best one of all is Ibn Fadlan. He was an ambassador from Baghdad, and the king of Bulgar wanted to become a Muslim, and he wanted to be a, become an associate, a vassal of the caliph in Baghdad. So the, the Baghdadi caliph sent Ibn Fadlan as a diplomat to take him a cloak to show that he was um, under his um, rule and gifts and to, to, to join their countries together. Now, this guy's hilarious because he's trying to describe everything very straight-laced as a proper diplomat would do. And he does a very good description, but he's shocked beyond means of what he sees when he meets these very early Scandinavians. So remember, this is some of the very first description of our, how many of you guys have Swedish, Danish, Finnish, Norwegian blood? <laughs> some of the earliest description of our ancestors. Well, I've seen the Rus as they came on their merchant journeys and encamped by the Volga River. I've never seen more perfect physical specimens, tall as date trees, blonde and ruddy. They don't wear tunics or caftans. They didn't weave a lot, right? But they wear a garment which covers one side of the body and leaves the hand free. Each man has an axe, a sword, a knife, and keeps by him at all times. And what each woman is wearing, but their most prized ornaments are these necklaces. He also talks about how they would put up wooden posts for their gods, and they would come and pray to these gods, saying, I've come from a distant land with such and such number of female slaves and such and such number of sable pets. Pelts, and he lists all his merchandise. Then he says, I brought this offering. He leaves the offering in front of the piece of wood, saying, I want you to bless me with a rich merchant with many dinars, that's the gold one, and dirhams, that's the silver coins, who will buy from me whatever I wish and not haggle over <laughs> any price that I set. Well, I think they must have brought a lot of girls to sell because there's all of that silver found every year along the Volga and the Dnieper rivers and across Sweden. So where did they get all these slave girls to sell that brought home so much silver? You know, if you find that much of the hordes, how much went into being um, melted down and used for other things that we don't see? We're talking millions of pieces, millions and millions of coins. Where did they come from? Now, when I read the sources, the authors, the historians say, well, they must have been Slavic girls. They must have captured them on the rivers <laughs> as they're going to um, the, the slave markets on the Caspian Sea. So Ibn, Ibn Fadlan, he met them on the Caspian Sea. We'll have a map later and you see that. And they come down. How they got there is they crossed the, the Baltic Sea from Scandinavia, from Sweden. Usually the Danish Vikings went west, but the Swedish ones went east. So they went into Russia. They took the rivers up to the areas um, where they could portage over to the Volga or the Dnieper. They wanted to go to Byzantium, they took the Dnieper. And if they wanted to go to the Caspian, I believe they took the Volga. So that's how they got there. So would they have just captured these girls on the last stages of the journey? I do not think so. I have five reasons why. I think they came from Western Europe. One is the Vikings liked to travel with lots of female slaves because they provided labor to carry all those pelts and amber and honey that they would trade, but also then they had sex and cooking. So not bad benefits from your product you're going to sell. 
We know that the Vikings carried women long distances in their longboats, and one way we know this is that four families in Iceland have Native American DNA in their blood from when they went from Iceland to Greenland to the New World to Canada, and they settled there. When they came back to Iceland, they brought Native women with them, or their children with Native women, and so the, the DNA entered the bloodstream. Um, in the funeral, we're going to talk about the next, in the future, the slave volunteered to be sacrificed for the king's funeral, perhaps showing a very long relationship with him. Well, maybe he's just fed up and just wanted to leave this world. <laughs> um, another reason, I believe, is the Russian steppes were very underpopulated in this area. Plus, if you stole their women, the locals are not going to provide the essential food or trade for furs with you when you come down the river. They're going to, to go inland. And so you would have lost your trade emporiums if you're stealing women on the way down. And the last reason is the Vikings were harvesting thousands of slaves from Western Europe every year. Now, we have a lot of Western sources about Vikings coming in and stealing all the women and children. But here's one from an Eastern source. This is from Iberia, when they came and attacked Spain. When they attacked, the coastal peoples fled in fear of them. They only appeared every six or seven years, never in fewer than 40 ships, and sometimes up to 100. They overcame anyone they met at sea, robbed them, and took them captive. They also came into the land and painted cities out. These women are valuable. My theory, the silver rush caused such massive slave raiding in the Atlantic for a product to trade for the silver available in Afghanistan on the Silk Roads. When this silver ended, when the mine was finally mined out, this port city of Hedeby in Sweden turned into a ghost town within a couple decades. So think about the silver mines in Colorado. When they all played out, those towns turned into ghost towns. Same thing we find here in the archaeology. Okay, I promised you the first ever description of burial rites. First, Ibn Fadlan talks about burials of people who are not high status or wealth. When a poor person dies, he just gets cremated in a little boat. When a slave dies, he becomes dog food. When a robber or thief dies, he's hung on a tree and left for the rain and the birds. But then he gives a witness, he witnessed the burial of a great man. And he said that a third of his wealth goes to his family, a third pays for his funeral clothes, and a third pays for booze. Because the funeral has a lot of that. So he goes on to describe this funeral in detail. It is so gory, but I'm gonna, this man has painted directly from Ibn's text. I'm gonna show you. They waited about They waited nine days to bury because they needed that long to get the proper clothes. Now, being on the silk road, they could get silk. So that here's our corpse, dressed in very fine clothes, and we have the slave girl who volunteered to be killed. And for days, they've been plying her with alcohol and a drug, so that she, at one point, they lift her up and shields. She's supposed to say what she sees, and one time she saw her father and mother and the green land, and then she saw the chief. So they knew she was going to be going to the right paradise. Um, but then they also slaughtered cows, or an oxen, and horse, but obviously they couldn't get those up into the ship. They surrounded, they loaded the ship on top of lots and lots of firewood because they're going to burn it. And then everyone has gotten drunk um, several times. They have passed the slave girl around to every one of this chief's chief men. They've all slept with her and given a message to give to the chief in the next world. And then right before she dies, they do it again, just to make sure she got it right. And then, I think it's his son, comes naked. Our, thank you, artist, for not doing that. And he covers up backside with a, his hand, and he's the one who lights the fire. And everyone is beating on their shields to cover up the noise as the angel of death, this old woman who's been plying her with drugs and alcohol, um, stabs her with a knife between the ribs. But they don't want to hear her cries, so they beat on the shields. So 
that's our ancestors. <laughs> those of us who are Scandinavians. <laughs> You know, sometimes they complain about missionaries going in and changing people's cultures, but I am so grateful that, that some came to Scandinavia and changed my culture. I am so glad that people are no longer doing human sacrifices for funerals. Here's the being reenacted in today's world. Even Burning Man, we just had last week in Nevada, was originally a human sacrifice. The, the, the burning one was made of wicker and was filled with human beings. So it's not so far in our past. Now, this is something really peculiar. This is not Viking. This is Bronze Age or Early Iron Age. And this is a cemetery, and each grave is surrounded in the shape of a boat. Now, this church is located between Aurora and Central City, Nebraska. It's called Cronberg Church. It was a little town, well, six, eight houses, settled by a Danish community that wanted to emigrate and homestead in Nebraska. And every year, the members of this church serve a Danish food, apple skeevers, these round donuts that are being turned into the pan, and um, give tours of their church that is built in the Scandinavian style. Oh, look at this church. This is the inside of the Cronberg church. See what's hanging from the roof? It's a ship. Now, the Bronze Age dead are buried within stones set up in a ship. The Vikings are buried or cremated in ships. And when they became Christian, they said Jesus is our navigator over troubled waters to the next world. I gave this speech um, in Stromsburg for Swedish days, and a Swedish woman said, we have those in our churches back in Sweden. So I looked it up, and there's, if you go to Google Images, you will find lots of churches. These aren't just Sweden, this is Finland and Lithuania, both places where Vikings sailed, and they hang ships in the ceiling of the church. So it goes back to clear the Bronze Age when a ship was your vessel to another world. Now, here's another one of illustrating a, 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 a modern rendition of what Ibn Fadlan would have seen with the sale of the, of the men and of his thing. And I propose, in fact, this is what my dissertation is on, is that once these girls and a few men who are castrated were sold on the Silk Road, that they could have been sold as far away as India and China. So these girls who were captured from London, Dublin, I, um, the shores of France, they could have been taken all the way up to Sweden, gone through that port, gone through Russia, come down to the Caspian Sea. So they're right. Kiev was their very first capital city, but it was founded by Vikings, and they are the ones who became the Russian people, or, or, or the rulers of the Russian people. But what I want to—I want to just give a fun few more facts of the Silk Road because the Silk Road also went into Constantinople. This is what we call the Byzantine Empire, but they call themselves the Eastern Romans, and um, into the the little country of Sicily right here. We're going to find out what the Vikings are hanging around in the Mediterranean. So when they arrived in Byzantium, 
At this point, the Greeks still had the secret to Greek fire. And this was some kind of napalm that just kept burning, and they could shoot it onto your ship and set it on fire. And so as long as they had that weapon, Constantinople was pretty safe against invaders. But to keep the secret of that weapon, each person who made Greek fire knew only one part of the recipe. And so in a time of plague, like the bubonic plague, if one person died, that recipe disappeared and has disappeared. They don't know what it is now. But at this point, the Vikings come down have with their ships coming through the Black Sea into Byzantium, and they attack Constantinople. And the, the Greeks made, the Greeks, the Byzantines, made short work of them because they had Greek fire. But you know what? Greeks don't like to pay for an army or to raise their own people to fight for an army. When they find a good fighter, they just hire them as mercenaries. So when these valiant, tall, rudy, white guys come down and attack them, they say, hey, these have been great soldiers. So they hired a whole bunch of Vikings as bodyguards for the royals, and they are called Varangian. The Varangian Guard. And you know what? They had to guard the holy family, the royal family, as they go through these to church. And this is in the church of Hagia Sophia. And they, these Greek Orthodox services last for hours. And they're in Greek. So, of course, these Scandinavian boys don't understand a word, but they got to stand there and guard the family. And so they're scratching around. And basically, this says, How dar was, how Dan was here. <laughs> in, <laughs> In Scandinavian ruins, on the, the box where the royal family sat is evidence of their, their Viking gods. They also, I'm sure they got drunk one night and said, let's make, uh, decorate this lion statue. And so along with this whole lion statue is runes, which is the Scandinavian writing. And, and then the Venetians came in the Fourth Crusade and they stole that lion and took it back to Venice. So if you want to see it now, you have to go to Venice. Now, Sicily, that's right down south of Italy. That's the ball that Italy's kicking. And it was a Muslim country for only about 200 years. And so the reason it is now Christian is because a Norman, remember they're good fighters, came with his army and they captured Sicily and had a Norman kingdom in Sicily and southern Italy for a couple hundred years. And so Roger II of Sicily was a Norman who brought Christianity back to that part of England. So now we can see how Viking travels were able to um, not just go to Baghdad by camel or to um, Bulgaria, the orbital Italy, but also to Constantinople and to the Mediterranean. They basically circled the whole area with their trade and with their IKEA ships. So. When I spoke on this at Stromsburg, someone said, well, what about all those Viking ruins in Minnesota? And I got to thinking, you know, I want to find out more about this because if you could take your ship and sail up those rivers in Russia and take them apart and portage over to the rivers that go back down to the Caspian Sea, why couldn't the Vikings who came, who are came another hundred years later, came to the New World. They're living in Canada. They go up the Hudson River into the Great Lakes. It's not very far to portage over to the Mississippi, or maybe they took the ocean route around and came up the Mississippi. I'm, I'm suspecting they portage over um, from the Great Lakes. Why couldn't they have done the same thing in the New World that they were doing in Russia? And there's very interesting ruins, ruins, R-U-N-E-S, not ruins, but there are archaeological ruins for the living in Canada. But the ruins are in, the, in the, the United States. I've just picked three of them, but there's a number of others. And I brought a book to show you of a woman who spent her life searching for these. But this one is in Minnesota, and it is actually after Vikings became Christians. Because they found their ten men dead, of uh, blood and dead read of blood and dead, and then they praise, ask him a prayer of the Virgin Mary, save us from evil. There's another one in Maine, which has a map. 
And when you talk to the experts, they say it's a few Norse words and then just a sea of gibberish. And then there's an entire state park over the Heavener rune stones in Oklahoma. much more studied in the rooms. And they say there's a 20% chance this could have come from Sweden. And here's what the difficulty is. Before printing, and these were all written before there was printing, everybody could spell however they sounded it out phonetically. Like, so when you're reading Old English, when you're reading Old English, it is spelled in so many different ways. And only Spelling was only standardized after you had printed books and, and everyone was trying to write in the same way in the same dialect. So if these explorers from Scandinavia, Norway, Denmark, were trying to write in their own dialects, and dialects change from village to village, mountain to mountain, if they're trying to write in their own dialect, it's going to sound like gibberish, kind of like um, if we hear someone who's speaking from the south, it sounds a lot different, right? There are dialects that come out of the Appalachian Mountains. They sound so different to us, and that's even after having print television. But before that, it was much more defined geographical differences in dialect. So if they, these explorers were writing in a dialect that's not been, that's been lost, there's no way to tell what, what scholars are calling gibberish could have been a dialect that's been lost once print came and standardized it. So I just leave it as a question to you. Are these American rooms authentic? Like the one in Minnesota was found buried under a tree that had been it, um, alive for over 100 years. And so it was very ancient. It wasn't just a, a very recent thing that was created. It was very old. The argument then of the, the scientists who say it's not is that Scandinavians were some of the very earliest settlers, and they could have made these stones as a joke, as a memory of the land. We don't know. But you know what? That's what makes history so fun. We can't answer all the questions. We still have things to find out. And so these are some of the things I've studied in my studies of, um, I'm studying white slave trade to Asia. This is chapter seven of one of my books. And so, that's what I found in the questions I have, and maybe you'll have some more questions. So now is when we open it up. Yeah, please. Now is when we open it up to the Q&A uh, portion. Does, does anybody have a question for Dr. Everything is crystal clear. You totally understand the Vikings and the slave trade now. There's, she's just that good. It's, uh, did we have one? So like with the runes around Minnesota and Maine, you kind of explained that with the water. Uh, you know, if it truly was like Vikings, but like in Oklahoma, uh, how would that be? They were found near a river, so if they came up the Missi came down the Mississippi and then took the Arkansas River, I believe it was, that um, they were found on the cliffs of that river. I'm kind of curious. I was shocked by that Gouda statue that had been discovered that was in Scandinavia, it come from from Central Asia, but made. Is there any evidence of Vikings who were actually practicing Buddhism? No. <laughs> Buddhists say don't kill. <laughs> I, that, that's, that's one of the things that shocked me. It didn't seem to line up. So, uh, you know, we have this Viking culture that 
seems to at least be partially driven on the slave trade, obviously. There's other things that are traded beyond slaves. That's so widespread. I mean, as you're talking about how deep they get into Asia, plus certainly in the Americas, maybe really deep, they, it almost sounds to me like the Mongol Empire, just in terms, maybe not unified, but the, the breadth of where they, they went. What was it about their culture that drove them to, to explore this far and to be this involved in trade? Why didn't this happen with the French or the English? Or you know, what, what was special about the Vikings? Um, some people say, well, they ran out of enough farmland. They're basically farmers who are setting out to find new farmland. But um, I don't buy that because if they didn't set out for long distances, they would just as happen to raid the village next door. And so I think it was very much this war culture, kind of like Spartans, of if we're not making war, what's the point of existing? Other question. That's my opinion. That, that so, makes a lot of sense to me. So I had a question about the, uh, oh wait, did your voice doesn't work? Well, just for the recording. Okay, so um, my question had to do with when you were throwing dates and they went by really quickly. But, so the, the Vikings were, I know, going, some of them were going east pre, uh, like, say, the six or eight hundreds, right? But in the eight or nine hundreds, that's when the, the, the Danes go west, right? So it said, but around 1300, you said, there was, um, I'm trying to think of what happened up the, um, in 1300, oh, we were talking about then, uh, how did they impact the Crusades? Because the Crusades happened all through the mid, you know, well, then and the middle, middle, age, middle age period, right, into the 1300s. And we were talking about Vikings in the 1300s going um, down south, too. You were talking about that. Sorry. So it sounds like we just have a, a question about the clarification just, of the I'm time. I'm just trying point. to clarify the timeline. Because the, the Crusades start 1096, 1098. In 1096, the Vikings were still pagan. They only became Christian much later. Right. Much, much later. So they're still raiding and pillaging all through Western Europe. Well, Western Europe is going to the Holy, Holy Lands running the Crusades. Right. I right. guess I always think of, I didn't think of it that way. I always thought, like, we had the Viking raiders, then the Crusades, and then we went. I didn't realize it was all happening. And actually, it, in 849, Europe's being attacked from the north by the Vikings and from the south by the uh, Muslims from North Africa and from Iberia. So they're getting up both times. And that's when Charlemagne comes up. Well, he was 800. Right. But when he becomes, because he's able to unify the people and fight back, both sides. Yeah, and the Vikings, they are essentially the reason why the Carolingian Empire ends up falling apart a you know, few decades after Charlemagne's death, because his heirs just couldn't get I mean, there's other issues like his three grandsons and whatnot. Though there is one little twist to the story. There is one group of Vikings that in the 900s, uh, led by a guy named Rollo, they settled down in France. The, a French king says, hey, we're going to, you know, if we give you land, will you stop killing and pillaging, that becomes, anybody know? Normandy. Normandy. And the Normans are also excellent fighters. They did go on the Crusades. They're separate from the Vikings at that point. They're speaking French. They're Christian. They, they also invade England. I was going to say that's really And then 1066, they take over England. So it's almost like there's something in their culture that even once they're not even speaking like Swedish or what the, the ancestor of Swedish is, they still have that warrior culture that just keeps going. So is religion stronger or culture? <laughs> Ooh, Can you answer wow. that for us, Dr. Henning? Is religion stronger or culture? Sometimes I think people can wield religion to make it do what their culture wants them to do. So I don't know the answer to that, but everybody's welcome to their opinion if you want to raise your hand. <laughs> Are there any other questions? My ancestors were from Hobbes. My ancestors were from Sicily. What's the chance of me having Viking blood? Um, pretty good. <laughs> because they lived there for 200 years. And um, the fun thing about Roger, the King Roger that we have, is that he, he 
you know, took over and made it a Christian country instead of a Muslim country. But he didn't want to give up the harem idea, so he had his own harem. <laughs> so he could have had lots of children, so there is a good chance. But also the Vikings were coming through the Slavic, because I know you're half Slavic too, so you could have Viking blood from both sides. <laughs> Sicily, that means you have old Italo-Romanic, you have Berber, you have Arabic, uh, and it, you know, one of the interesting things about Roger is he, because he still had connections to the Muslim world, he commissions the first world map. Uh, not the whole globe, because the West is not discovered at that point, but the Eastern Hemisphere. It's not a really good map. Have you, have you seen this before, Dr. Hayne? Not a great map, but it is essentially a Christian world. It's like, I want to know what the world's like. And so he asked the Muslims, because they have been traveling around the world, and they create kind of Europe, Asia, Africa map-ish. If you want to see it, you look up the Idrisi map. And what's really cool about it, one of the arguments in my book is that the reason so many slaves were coming out of Europe is that it was the poor country, the poor continent. And what we would call the global south. Well, in this map, it's upside down. So Europe is in the south. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it does us good to remember that before the 14 and 1500s, Europe was the backwater. It was the one where it's I mean, the way I've heard it described a lot is Europe was living. The Middle Middle Ages are essentially post-colonial Europe. What, does anybody know who colonized Europe before that? The Romans. The Romans essentially colonize Europe, Rome falls apart, and Europe is left to warlords for a thousand years. And even when they almost get it together in the Carolingian Empire, in comes a new set of warlords, the Vikings, putting them back in the Middle Ages a little bit longer. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's give Dr. Hayne one more round of applause. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. And you will be able to do this again someday. Thank you, everybody. Did you all sign up for your student? You get extra credit. If you're one of my students, you need to come up and introduce yourself.